Welcome back, uh, everyone. Uh, so now we'll have a panel discussion uh, about Hilbert questions uh, in AI. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with the term uh, Hilbert questions, uh, in the year 1900, uh, a very famous mathematician, David Hilbert, uh, proposed a series of uh, unsolved original problems in mathematics that played uh, a critical role in inspiring generations of mathematicians during the uh, 20th century. So uh, continuing on that uh, notion, we'd like to discuss today uh, Hilbert questions in, in, in AI. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and we have uh, three panelists, myself, uh, uh, Tommy Poggio, from whom you've uh, heard already, and, and Stephanie Telex. So the, the plan is that uh, we're going to have um, uh, a very short uh, uh, introduction by uh, each one of us on what we think are uh, fundamental challenges. Uh, and then we'll open it up for discussion uh, among us, but also uh, to uh, answer all your comments and all your questions. So I also want to thank everyone who, uh, who put a, a lot of questions in the Google Doc. There are a lot of interesting questions there, uh, which are really fascinating. Uh, I'm not sure we'll have uh, time and be able to do justice to all of them, uh, but we'll try and we'll do our best. Uh, so to get started, I'd like to uh, invite and introduce uh, Stephanie Telex, who hasn't spoken here yet. Uh, she's uh, uh, an expert, she's a professor in uh, um, uh, uh, computer science and robotics at, uh, at Brown University, uh, and, uh, and she has made uh, similar co contributions to, to studying language, to studying uh, uh, actions and, and intentions in, in robots. Uh, and uh, so uh, I'd like to invite her to uh, show your screen if you want and, and tell us uh, what are the most uh, fundamental challenges uh, for robots, for AI, uh, for you, for us, for the field. Cool. Uh, so I, I was super excited to be invited to serve on this panel because um, totally independently, I was telling George, my colleague at Brown, that we needed to think about what are the Hilbert questions uh, in AI. Uh, so I spent a little bit of time today reading about David Hilbert and you know how he came to pose these questions. It was at a meeting of the mathematicians in 1900 at the turn of the century. And I thought it was really interesting that one of the questions that he posed uh, is that there exists a set of axioms for math that's consistent. Um, and of course, that, that question uh, turned out to not be right. That is, there's no set of axioms that are powerful enough that include arithmetic that in which all two statements have proofs. There exist statements, either you have to choose to have axioms, to have everything have a proof, but have some things have contradictions, or you have you can prove or you can prove that there exist true statements with no proofs, um, which is this is Gödel's incompleteness theorem. Uh, so in a little sense, like he was trying when he was posing these questions to ask like really fundamental, big, encompassing questions to like establish what are the foundations of mathematics. Um, and in some sense, that that is like the the one of the most important questions was that it was almost ill posed. You cannot prove that these theorems, these axioms, are consistent if it, it's not possible. Um, so, uh, in AI, um, I think for the Hilbert questions, for for these fundamental foundational questions, I think you have to start with the Turing test. Um, partly because it came first. It was the first such question posed by an AI researcher by Alan Turing. And partly because I think it really does um, say something about what it means to be AI complete. Um, so, so the idea of AI completeness is if I can solve this problem, then I can solve all the rest of AI too, right? So like chess, let's say, is not AI complete. I can, I have, I have programs that can beat human players at chess, but I haven't solved all of AI, right? Um, so Alan Turing tried to write down the, an AI complete problem uh, in, in when he wrote down this test that a autonomous system and, you know, autonomous agent over a typewritten interface using language um, has to fool a human interlocutor, a human who's asking questions 
um, about the autonomous agent and trying to figure, and specifically the human is trying to figure out if the, if the agent is an AI or not an AI. So there's a lot of people running like Turing chatbot competitions, but in almost all of those competitions, the human is not allowed to be like trying to figure out if it's an AI. Like they're supposed to go with the agent and talk about Shakespeare or something and not like actually ask the tough questions that Turing puts in his examples of things that you could ask if you were really trying to figure out, is it an AI or is it not an AI? Um, and by doing that, he kind of opens up the whole domain of, of human experience uh, to talk to the agent. Um, but I am a roboticist. So for me, AI, always comes back to a robot, a perception system, an actuation system, and a compute element working together in order to carry out complex tasks in the world. So the, the task that I thought of that kind of motivated me to think of Hilbert problems was pick and place. Um, the idea that we should make a robot, a mobile manipulator robot that can drive into any indoor environment, even if there's lots of clutter and stuff. And a human can say in words, any object they want that robot to pick up and the robot, and it might not be in the, even in the same room. And then the robot has to be able to drive around, find the object, maybe open drawers and cupboards and push things around and pick it up and deliver it to the person. Um, and I like this problem because it captures a lot about robots, but it's also kind of a fundamental thing that a robot in the home would need to do. Um, and so I think if we nailed it, there would be a lot of real world impact. Um, but Hilbert had, of course, 24 problems. Uh, so the other thing is we don't get, we, we have to pick a lot of them. Um, and I'm really excited to hear what you all have to say about what else is out there and whether these are good ones and, and stuff. Okay, very good. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Stephanie. That sounds uh, very interesting. C can I ask you very quickly before we get to Tommy, can you give us a quick idea of where, where are we right now? Uh, what, what kind of robot do in, in, the, in the pick an object uh, task that you just alluded to? Uh, how, how far are we? I, I liked that. I mean, one reason I like that task is I think my group is close to it. Um, so we have a lot of different pieces um, right now. Uh, Trevor Darrell's group at Berkeley made a really nice paper that takes images of, of scenes and natural language descriptions and then segments out the object in the scene that matches the description. So you say, you know, the big gray car and it, and it gives you a mask around the big gray car um, with deep learning. So that's pretty cool. Um, it doesn't handle if there's no big gray car in the scene. It doesn't handle that case very well. Uh, it doesn't handle looking for the big gray, gray car. If it's outside your, I'm making like a camera field of view with my hands there. It doesn't handle looking for the big gray car if it's not already in the field of view, but that's like one piece. Um, my student, Arthur Wenzel, uh, and my PhD student, Caillou uh, Zeng, made systems where we abstracted away the detector. We just said, assume we have a detector for the thing. Um, and assume a fan-shaped field of view for the camera. And we had the robot infer where it should go to find the object. And it could take information about where it was from the language and information from its sensor and systematically search in environments until the object was detected, until it was found. So that's kind of the detection piece. Um, and then my student Bingji um, recently submitted a paper where we can do we can, it's an it's an end to end push and grasp system. So it learns to, if there's like a clutter of objects on the table, it learns to push aside objects so that it can clear them so that it can pick up an object um, and pick it up. And she's just extended it to call. So like the original system would just clear the table, but she extended it to so you can call it shot. You can give it a mask and it'll push stuff aside to pick up that particular object that's been masked out. Uh, so I'm kind of excited to put those three things together um, and, and have, I mean, it, I don't know how well it'll work end to end because robots are robots, but, um, but like, you know, in all of those pieces, you know, we should be able to do for the first time generalized language-based pick and place where you can give a description of an object the robot's never seen 
the robot can find it, it can push stuff out of the way, and it can pick the damn thing up. That sounds uh, fascinating. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, hopefully, we'll, we'll come back to, uh, to the robots. Uh, Tommy, what are the Hilbert questions in AI? So there were 23 Hilbert's problems that he presented in 1900 in Paris. This was the world exhibition um, at the largest Congress of Mathematicians at the time. There were as many as 200 mathematicians. Um, in fact, he never presented it. He did not attend the conference. It was published after later. <laughs> but as Gabriel mentioned, it had a big impact for many decades to come even today. Um, unlikely, our Hilbert problem will have a similar impact, but here I go. My personal um, dream would be to answer the following question. Um, how can circuits of neurons compute programs or routines? The kind of programs that must underlie a number of typical human activities such as, as language. Um, separate question is, of course, how evolution discovered that. Um, and of course, where in the brain and can we ever record from such neurons while they are creating programs and routines? Um, we are far away from, I think, from answering this kind of question, apart from the neuroscience, um, you know, the length of some of them, uh, just a question in principle, how to have a neural network that can do that. Um, there is, uh, of course, uh, um, you know, an answer we know, but it's kind of trivial, is you can essentially embed a program in a digital network, in a computer, and run it. But I really want to know how a more biologically plausible network could, uh, um, could do that. And in fact, how neurons, real neurons could do that. So here it is, just stopping here. Okay, very good. Thank you, uh, thank you, Tommy. Uh, because we organized this, I, I gave rather uh, vague instructions to all the panelists. So I, I didn't necessarily, um, specify that it had to be a single question. So here are uh, a, a handful of questions that I think are, are, are quite uh, fundamental and uh, we can divide them into a, sort of a five-year questions or, or 10-year questions or 50-year or, or questions. Uh, some of these I think are uh, exciting frontier questions that are uh, amenable to, to current uh, uh, research and that I think will transform uh, both neuroscience as well as uh, AI uh, in the years to come. So I'm going to list uh, these uh, six questions very briefly and then uh, come up with uh, uh, one, one example uh, that uh, I think it relates to the questions that uh, Tommy and, and Stephanie were raising, uh, which I'm uh, particularly intrigued about. So one is, uh, the first question is, how do we go from connectomes to computation and back? So for those of you who don't know, there has been a major revolution in neuroscience over the last decade. We now have the ability to interrogate neural circuits uh, with unprecedented uh, resolution. We are beginning to have very detailed wiring diagrams of who talks to whom and when uh, in terms of uh, neurons in different parts of uh, cortex. We don't quite have yet a circuit diagram of uh, the human brain. We have a circuit diagram of the uh, uh, nematode uh, C. elegans, uh, and we are going to have very soon uh, uh, complete wiring diagrams of uh, other species, probably the fly that Tommy was uh, talking about uh, uh, earlier uh, today. 
What we don't have yet is how do we go from those connectomes to AI? How do we go from connectomes to function and to be able to infer computation and vice versa, given a particular cognitive function or a particular computation that we're interested in, how can we go about finding that uh, uh, given uh, a wiring diagram? Another way to pose this question is imagine that you are a Martian and you come to Earth and I'll give you the wiring diagram of a computer and you have to figure out what the computer does purely based on the wiring diagram. The second one I think relates very uh, closely to what Tommy was alluding to, and it has to do with how we, how we can link cognitive behaviors to neural circuits. There's been a, about a century of exciting discoveries in, in psychology and in studying behavior. And it's been very, very challenging to sort of move from uh, that uh, sort of a phenomenological description of behavior uh, into neural circuit uh, level computational models. And I think this is also an urgent and exciting uh, question uh, to, to, to pursue. Uh, this is, uh, the, the third one is a little bit perhaps uh, not directly connected to a Hilbert question in AI, uh, but I think a very fundamental corollary of understanding brain function is how to fix brains when they malfunction. The brains are the most uh, precious devices that we have on earth. They are the most expensive devices uh, that we have on earth uh, uh, in terms of the, the cost to our uh, uh, health system. Uh, so if we really truly understood uh, brain function, not only uh, could we uh, educate computers to function more uh, like humans, uh, but we might be able to also fix brains. And I think that's also an urgent question. In terms of uh, directly linking to computer science and AI, uh, we need to search for adequate learning rules and loss functions. I think this is a, a critical uh, question. How do we train algorithms? Uh, how well do these algorith algorithms uh, generalize uh, to out of distribution problems? So uh, we, we've been uh, getting quite good at certain problems uh, uh, like uh, achieving high performance in a particular data set like ImageNet. Many of those algorithms still uh, struggle to work in real world scenarios. So this is a problem of generalization, uh, which also has impacts for issues about biases uh, in, in computational algorithms. And ultimately, we want to be able to incorporate uh, world knowledge uh, into these uh, algorithms. And, and, and with that, I, I want to quickly show uh, just one image uh, that uh, many people, uh, uh, including ourselves, have used before just to describe uh, some of the problems uh, and, and, and some of the exciting paths. Uh, here's a picture uh, where, and, um, where uh, all of you, in a glimpse, uh, can understand uh, pretty well what's going on. So uh, as uh, Jim pointed out in his talk, we're getting uh, decently good now in terms of understanding that this picture is indoors. Uh, we may be able to uh, detect faces. In fact, uh, any of your uh, uh, digital uh, uh, smartphones can detect faces and use that to, to, to focus on a face. Uh, we can also do face recognition and recognize that Obama is here. Uh, and we can do a lot of uh, quite amazing things that uh, were undreamt of uh, merely uh, uh, one decade ago. And yet I would contend that we're still very, very far from understanding what's uh, actually going on in this picture and what, why this picture is uh, 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 a little bit funny. So as you can see, uh, Obama here is being playful. Uh, you need to understand, to be able to comprehend what's going on in this picture, you need to understand that, uh, that humans are often uh, self-conscious about their weights. You need to understand that this is a scale some of you are perhaps too young and have never seen a scale like this. So this, uh, this gentleman here is, is measuring his weight. Uh, and you need to understand that Obama is exerting a force here. You need to also uh, grasp the idea that uh, he is unaware of what's going on and that all of these people are smiling, partly perhaps because he's Obama uh, and therefore they have to smile, but also because uh, he's sort of being playful and, and exerting a force here, therefore changing uh, this gentleman's way. So, so this goes way beyond our ability to count how many shoes there are in this picture, how many people there are in this picture, recognizing Obama, understanding that this is a mirror and so on. There has to be an ability to spatially and temporally integrate all the different uh, pieces of information and also uh, put this together with uh, basic knowledge and basic understanding that we have about the world. What, what, what Tommy alluded to as uh, abstract knowledge uh, and, and abstract concept, how are they encoded? How can they be brought uh, to, um, uh, to understand uh, uh, an, an image uh, like this one. So that's, that's, that's all I wanted to say uh, for now.
so those are some of my Hilbert questions and one specific concrete example of uh, something that I find uh, quite fascinating and, 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 and quite mysterious. So I'm gonna stop here. So Stephanie, do you think that your robots can do this? They can uh, take this picture and understand uh, whether it's funny or not? Not yet. Um, but I think, you know, I think that example gets at why robots are important, uh, you know, because you're talking about the force that he's exerting and being able to predict what's going to happen next, you know, that, that because he's exerting the force, it, you know, he's going to read a wrong reading on the scale and the effects of the actions people are taking in the world. Um, my hope or, or, or my, my guess is that the right way to do that is to have an agent that can take its own actions and then can reason about what actions to take and then apply that reasoning to other agents in the world to try to understand what they're doing and why. Okay, very good. Um, I have uh, uh, several questions that people put forward in our uh, Google Doc and I uh, maybe I'll, I'll read some of them and uh, these, these are really, uh, a lot of these are really very good questions, very hard questions. I have no idea how to answer them. So I'll just relegate them to Tommy and Stephanie who are way smarter than I am. Uh, so one question is uh, from Sasha Frolich. I apologize if I'm mispronouncing your name, Sasha. So uh, the question is, can intelligence creativity emerge in a deterministic system? What role might stochasticity, that is intrinsic randomness, and or chaotic behavior play for the emergence of intelligence and creativity? No idea. <laughs> I could have predicted that we were going to say that. Stephanie, do you need randomness in robots? Um, I suspect you don't need it, but it probably is, is good. Um, you know, I think, you know, a lot of our random algorithms, when they use randomness, you know, they, they use randomness, they're using, they're not using real randomness, they're using pseudo random number generators, which are, of course, are completely deterministic, right? You start with the same random C and you get the same thing out. Um, and I suspect that's probably good enough. Um, you know, like you don't need cryptographic, <laughs> cryptographically secure uh, random number generation to, to get that sort of behavior. Um, but I don't know, creativity is like a big word. It's a complicated, like, like what is creativity, right? Like, um, I sort of feel like maybe we'll, we'll, we'll go back after we have AI and go back and say, oh, that, that's great. You know, that, that chunk, that module, those things working together is what's creativity. Um, rather than maybe trying to design it in in advance. So I'm, I'm intrigued by the notion. So there, there have been a couple of uh, uh, attempts in AI uh, recently to, uh, to, to create art uh, in the form of visual art, in the form of music. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm intrigued by the notion that maybe creativity is nothing more and nothing less than uh, a suitable cost function. In the case of art, that cost function may indicate, is this beautiful or not? Is this attractive or not? Uh, for example, a given piece of art uh, or, or a given piece of music uh, and pseudo random uh, exploration. So semi-intelligent exploration combined with uh, adequate machine learning to discriminate uh, which of those directions are good and which ones are not. And, and maybe that's enough to define creativity. That, that's at least a simple definition of creativity perhaps. I mean, that makes me think about like the Chinese room problem and you know, the, the idea that from Searle that, you know, this question of like, if you have a person inside of a room looking up books in a dictionary and somehow they can speak Chinese, but where's the thing that's actually understanding Chinese? Um, and the answer, you know, if you're a computational thinker is that like actually for that to happen, for the, for the person to really be responding fast enough for the, for the system of the human plus the book to really be responding fast enough, they just have to be really, 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 really fast at looking things up in their book to the point where it's like one of our computers. Um, so I, you know, and I think that your example is, is, is legit, 
like if you had such a system and it went fast enough and the cost function was good enough, then yeah, it would work. Um, but then the, the devil, of course, is in the details. Like, how do you make it go fast enough? Um, what structure are you going to have for that cost function? And how are you going to decide what to test? And how are you going to test stuff fast enough to get that speed that is what we really mean when we say that? We do have a question in the Q&A, if you'd like. Uh, yes, uh, go, go ahead and, and then I'll read some more questions from the Google Doc. There are plenty in there as well. So, um, uh, Sounds good. So this one is uh, comparing these set of questions to the Hilbert questions in mathematics. It seems the questions in math are more concrete. Do you think that is the case? The pick and place question Stephanie put forward seems to be concrete enough though. Is that the right amount of breadth a possible Hilbert question should have? Well, I'm not sure concrete is the right word because there are other mathematical questions, um, abstract questions. They are more formally defined, yes. And uh, at least some of them um, had, a, they were almost conjecture that Hilbert had, which turned out some to be right and some to be wrong. Um, so, um, I think uh, it, it is in the nature of what we are doing, which is not strictly mathematics, um, that we, we are by necessity not as formally precise as it could be. But, you know, this may be just an excuse. We, certainly, I don't feel like uh, being Hibbert. I mean, I think it's it's important to at least, I mean, some of Hilbert's questions actually failed in the sense that there is currently, like they're, they're considered too vague today, you know, to say whether we've resolved them or not. Um, and I think that's a failure on Hilbert's, I mean, not, not to diminish, you know, that he did a good job and all, but like, that's something to avoid, right? Like we, when we pose these questions, I think that it is important to, that you know, there's there, there's a possibility of consensus that we've we've resolved it. Um, that there's some check that is objective because we're scientists, right? Like we should be able to know if we've if we've reached this milestone or not. But I I do think it's a fair statement that. Um, as, as Tommy pointed out, I think, I think we're in both in neuroscience and AI and, and cognition, uh, we are not, I think, I think it's fair to say that we're not where mathematics was in the 1900s. Uh, I, I would contend that mathematics had several millennia of, of, of progress and success. And depending on exactly how you count, neuroscience and AI are very young disciplines uh, with a few decades. So um, I think we can allow a little bit of less concreteness right now in terms of uh, our, uh, our definition of the Hilbert question, but, but, but I think it's a perfectly fair uh, comment. Okay, I'm going to read another question from, uh, uh, from, from the audience. Um, and this goes back to uh, uh, linking brains and machines. This question comes from Bobby Brown. And the question is uh, that there are two questions here. Um, what sort of advances in electronics and technology are needed to build a machine to think? how to go about building a circuit that has the versatility of the neuron? And does a machine need to be based on the brain to be able to think? I definitely think a machine does not need to be based on the brain to be able to think. Um, you know, and I, I, I turn uh, over that. What? I agree. I agree. Yeah. Great. <laughs> And I think that, you know, for me, the reason I think that is going back to Turing again um, and the universality of computation. Um, I think that, you know, what AI is and what it will be is a computer. And I, and I know people say, you know, well, we thought AI was, we thought brains were steam engines back when that was the cool thing. Um, but, you know, Turing gave us some really nice math that said that computation is universal. And I think that there's a lot of reasons to think that the brain, that what the neurons in the brain are doing is a form of computation. Um, and by the universality of computation, 
that can run on any any substrate. Um, the the devil or the trick is that it's got to run fast. Um, and the brain, of course, is is massively parallel, unlike our computers, which our GPU is more, but like are, are much less parallel than the brain. Um, and it may be that you need that level of parallelism in some form in order to make things work. So the, the way I usually describe uh, the connection between brains and AI is that um, I think we can learn a lot from brains and because brains are the products of uh, millions of years of evolution, they, they, can do, uh, they can solve problems in interesting ways. Uh, and, and, and we can learn from those tricks to be able to build uh, uh, intelligent machines and, and, and AI. But, but certainly, uh, it doesn't have to be that way. As, as Stephanie pointed out, we can build algorithms on completely different hardware uh, using uh, completely distinct uh, uh, principles that are completely unrelated to, uh, to the brain, and they can still be considered to be intelligent, they can still be considered to be thinking, and they may outperform humans and, uh, and other animals in, in many ways. I think we're at this stage right now, it's, uh, it's very, very clear that animals and humans still outperform the best machines in a wide number of tasks, in many, many, many different tasks. Not all of them. Uh, machines are much better at uh, uh, visual pattern recognition of barcodes in the supermarket. You certainly do not want humans uh, to, to solve that task. Uh, but but there, there's a plethora of tasks uh, uh, from basic um, pick and place to navigation to understanding that this image of Obama is funny uh, to language to communication and whatnot that where humans are much better. So I think we can learn from uh, neuroscience, but we don't need to uh, uh, have, uh, we don't really need to have uh, brains necessarily in the um, uh, in, in the question. I think we can gain a lot from, from that uh, conversation, from that dialogue, but it doesn't have to be that way. With respect to the first question, I'm curious to know what, what Stephanie thinks. Uh, my, my guess is that we don't really need new technology. New technology is, is great. And if we can get better GPUs and more parallel computing, that, that's going to accelerate research for sure. That's always fantastic. But I would, uh, I would argue that we need better ideas. We need more ideas and, and, and better algorithms. Uh, not just uh, uh, sit down and, and wait for better Howard. I totally agree with you. Um, my, my colleague George, um, his advisor, um, I forgot his name. Um, the, 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 the RL guy at UMass Amherst, um, the famous one, A Andy. Uh, Barton, Sutton. Uh, yeah, uh, Andy Barto. I'm, I'm sorry, sorry. Okay. I'm getting his name. Okay. Thank you. Um, right. He said that um, he thinks that there's only 50 papers between us and AI, 50 papers that have to get written between us and, and strong AI. But the problem is it's not like, like later, you know, when, when, we, when we trace back the line from now to then, it's going to be 50 papers, but it's this giant space and we're searching in the random space, right? So to get to that line of 50 papers, you know, all of these other papers get written as we search. And the other problem that happens is that like all of these other papers, as you sort of spread out in the search, they have this wonderful property that they solve important problems in the real, real world that people will pay you for. Um, and that's actually really awesome and amazing. So what happens is that instead of working on the 50 papers towards AI, people go off in other directions and they work on wonderful, important problems with real world impact, which of course we want, but, but, but there's relatively few people, you know, working on the, the line that's sort of focused on the, on, on the AI thread, if you will. Um, and I think that there, that, you know, one of the things that's exciting to me about, about this whole summer school and then the whole group at MIT that's thinking about brains, minds, and machines is it's like a group of people that's like, yes, let's think about AI. Let's think about, what could be on that path of 50 papers. Um, and we think a lot, you know, at Brown, me and George and Michael think a lot about action, perception, manipulation, decision-making, abstraction and symbols, and combining all of that with learning to make a robot go. Um, and one of the things I hoped the Hilbert problems could be or should be is like milestones along the way. Like we may not know how to do this yet, but we think this is a milestone along the way so that we don't have to like, you know, be searching for this thing that's 50 years out, but we can find these mileposts and work on those. 
along the path to AI. Tommy, do you want to say anything about this? Um, no, I think it's, it's important to realize that when we speak about intelligence, um, we, we, we tend to, mis to be misleading to ourselves. We've, when we speak about intelligence, we really think about human intelligence. I personally think there are an infinite variety of intelligences. And evolution, of course, has converged on one. And, uh, and uh, this one depends strongly on a lot of constraints that evolution had to deal with, including properties of cells and neurons and so on. So now, if we have if we want to build machines that replicate this particular form of intelligence, then of course, um, hardware limitations play a role. Uh, I believe, like Stephanie said correctly, that um, you know, a Turing machine is a universal computer. It could be able to simulate everything on it. But of course, um, if you have the right hardware, it's easier to do it or faster to do it and faster to do experiments. So having hardware similar to brain's hardware, I don't think this is GPUs, but uh, uh, will make this task easier. But in principle, hardware does not matter. Okay, I'm gonna put together uh, two uh, related questions uh, that may be better perhaps left off by uh, to someone who's speaking tomorrow, but just let me just read them. Uh, uh, Meng Mizang asks, do machines have their own uh, desires? And then later on, Manuela Raos asks, what do you think is the importance of understanding consciousness in our quest to create human level intelligence? Can a non-conscious AI pass the Turing test? I like this, that second question. <laughs> okay, so it's uh, it's all yours. Well, I like it because uh, this is a debate that I had multiple times with with Christoph. Christoph Koch was uh, my first graduate student and was the advisor of Gabriel, so a lot of relations here. And uh, Christoph maintains that intelligence and consciousness are separate. Um, I believe, and you know, this is one of the situations where none of us can can uh, right now have, can have good arguments to claim is right or more right than the other one. But I I think uh, um, if you have a Turing test for consciousness, this will look very much similar to a Turing test for intelligence. And by the way, I think that Turing test is still the best definition of human intelligence that I know of. And, uh, but you know, it's a very interesting discussion. I think if anybody can come up with some good story or example why a Turing test for consciousness should, should be different from a Turing test for intelligence or um, situations in which you could uh, think that uh, this other thing you are interacting with is intelligent but not conscious or conscious but not intelligent. I'd love to hear that. So I think that uh, maybe tomorrow the first talk by Christoph will uh, have a different view on, on, on this uh, question. Uh, yeah. so maybe, oh. maybe, maybe we should have had uh, Tommy and Christoph debate uh, uh, here. Mm -hmm. uh, Stephanie, what do you think about uh, consciousness? Uh, are robots conscious? Uh, will, will robots, uh, the, the ex machina scenario, uh, uh, will, will, will that happen soon? And, and how, what's the relationship between consciousness and intelligence? I mean, I think the only, the only person I really know is conscious is me, because I get to see me on the inside. Um, and I think that, <laughs> you know, all the rest of you are, are philosophical zombies. And I, you know, I don't know if you have, um, conscious experiences or not, right? I I think from that perspective, I am 
willing to assign, you know, things that are not me consciousness, or at least, you know, the moral and ethical um, rights as autonomous agents like me, who experience the world like me. Um, you know, I, I, I think, you know, I try to buy cage free eggs because I think chickens have some kind of consciousness and it sucks to st stick them in small cages and break their legs and all that. Um, so I'm willing to assign consciousness to our computational entities as well. You know, I think by the same logic, you know, if something comes up and it starts talking to me and it starts acting like a conscious agent, um, that I think it probably does have some amount of consciousness, but an intelligence or something, I don't know, like some right to be treated as a moral, intentional, Dan Dennett uses the word, the intentional stance, an intentional entity, right, that I'm going to assume has its own goals and that I'm going to reason about in that way, that has a moral worth, you know, that deserves, that has certain rights and stuff like that. I think our agents will have that. Um, I think we're probably a ways away from that, though. Um, you know, I give our chicken, I, I think a chicken has more moral worth than our AI agents today. Um, I don't really know how that interacts with consciousness. I, 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 I think Tom, Tom, Tommy asked a good question. Um, you know, like, how, what would the difference be between an test for intelligence and a test for consciousness? I don't know the answer. I mean, I, I, I sort of feel like, I mean, you know, Doug Hofstadter in the mind's eye, like talks about consciousness as being like the thing that happens when you have an agent with enough computational weights to, to make models of itself. And then you get this effect of like, uh, of infinity mirrors looking at each other. Um, and that infinite reflection is what is consciousness. Um, and so it's computationally grounded, but this kind of trick, you know, um, and that's the, the most rightest thing I've heard, uh, but I really don't know. I think, I, I, I don't know if it matters that much. I think that there's concrete research questions to work on now, you know, how can we make the agent do things it can't do right now? Um, and that's enough for me. So I, I, I agree with these comments. I just want to relate uh, one um, um, brief experience that we had in the summer course a few years ago. Uh, Mark Rybert uh, from uh, Boston Dynamics was showing off uh, some of uh, his amazing robots uh, uh, who um, can uh, um, really have a, a pretty amazing amount of stability. And, uh, and, and in order to train these, uh, these robots, um, they, they, they do all sorts of things. In one of the videos that are available uh, for everyone in YouTube, you can just uh, Google this. Uh, they push these robots pretty violently to train them and to see how stable they are. And I got so to do it once when I visited okay, so, so Maybe Stephanie did it. So uh, the, the entire audience, this is an audience of amazing, very smart PhDs and whatnot. Uh, everybody was scandalized. They, they thought that the investigators, the humans were being cruel to, this, uh, to these machines. So I, I don't know, certainly this is, I, I don't want to claim that this is anything even close to consciousness, but my, my, my guess is that as soon as there is uh, some very, very rudimentary form of apparent volition and some rudimentary form of communication in the form of language, humans will be very, very willing to ascribe consciousness uh, to, to machines. That doesn't really mean consciousness, perhaps in the way that that I would describe or that Christoph would describe as, as true consciousness. Uh, but I, I, just in terms of uh, how people relate to, to machines, uh, I think that we don't need much. I think that just uh, basic notions of volition and basic notions of, uh, of communication and language are sufficient for people to, to refer to machines. I mean, as, I mean as, people as, have pet rocks, right? Like, and they, 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 they do, they do, exactly. So I think that if they have pet rocks, they, they will have uh, pet machines that they will uh, be uh, really endeared to in, in, in many ways. But, but this, this doesn't really get at the fundamental core question of co whether consciousness and intelligence are the same thing or not. The, the field of human-robot interaction has a lot of really, a really interesting, like half of HRI, human-robot interaction, is about studying how people relate to robots. Um, and they don't care if they're teleoperating the robots. They're really cognitive scientists and psychologists studying how people relate to these autonomous systems. And one of the coolest um, results, they made a weight loss robot. So all it was was a little head. It, this was at MIT at the Media Lab from Cynthia Brazil's lab. Um, they made a little head robot with a face, and it looked at you. Um, and then there was like a keyboard and mouse interface to like enter how much um, your weight was every day and keep a, a, a weight loss journal. Um, and then they had a non-robotic version. And it turns out that just having this little head that looks at you, 
that's all it did, you know, made people more likely and, and more willing to engage with the weight loss program and write their weight down every day and all of that stuff. Um, so it's, it, it, there's, there's a lot of results in HRI like that, that like somehow putting it on a little thing that moves, it doesn't even, it does, and as you say, it doesn't take much, um, really has a profound effect on people. Um, and I think that comes back to a little bit the intentional stance. We as roboticists, I think, have a responsibility when we create a robot not to overclaim unintentionally, even with its body language, what it does and what it can understand. That's a failure mode of our robots. So some of the HRI studies say that like, if you act more competent than you are, then you fail, that's better, that's worse than, you know, be, giving, being realistic about what you can and can't do, even if that's not as competent as, as um, you could be, as you could claim to be. Very good. Uh, th there are a lot of uh, uh, excellent uh, questions in the Google Doc, uh, in the Share Google Doc, but I also want to give uh, people in the audience the opportunity to ask questions. So, Chris, uh, if you're still here, uh, maybe you've been able to look at the Q&A and, and, and select some of those questions uh, up for discussion. Sure thing. Uh, one that's risen to the top is, uh, on the topic of hardware, can you comment if you think that the development in deep learning or, in fact, AI could be possible without GPUs, uh, which we rely on every day? I think, I think no. Um, I think, you know, we had neural nets around for a long time. Uh, and I think that GPUs crossed with lots of data was the thing that changed that made them start to work. Great. I've got the, another one. Um, does, uh, it just moved. Uh, Atanas Stankov is asking, uh, does more of X paradox come into play for these questions? I don't know what that is. So that I, I think, uh, I'm, I'm not sure I'm gonna uh, phrase it uh, correctly. Maybe Tommy knows uh, better, but uh, this is the idea that there's, um, a pretty strong divide uh, in terms of um, what computers are good at and what humans are good at. Uh, so uh, certain tasks uh, uh, that, that humans are extremely good at uh, uh, require very little computation. Uh, and, and, and some of the things that are, are only very, very easy to us are, are extremely uh, challenging for, for machines. So we have computers that can calculate the square root of two very well, recognize barcodes very well, uh, but we're nowhere even close to having a computer that can play soccer like Lionel Messi, for example, and, and, and so on. And the question is? Uh, I'm, I'm not sure what the question is. I think this was referring to the, the question was whether the, this paradox comes into play in the, uh, I'm, I'm not sure if I follow the question, but, but I think, yes, in general, I think that there is um, sometimes there is this double dissociation between what's easy for machines and what's hard for humans and, and so on. Yeah, that's something that Marvin Minsky used to say. It was easy for us, it's difficult for machines and vice versa. And I think is is still true. I think if you think about what, what, where jobs would be lost to AI in the future, it would be in uh, things like physicians, um, traders, airline pilots, whereas, say, the plumber will be employed for a long, long time. You know, the person that fixes your house, um, what is broken there, would be very difficult to replace for a long, long time. Um, so, um, uh, what is the answer to this? Well, evolution had literally millions of years to evolve visual and motor systems. And, uh, you know, language and mathematics, much shorter time. So that's one answer. Great. Uh, we have another one here from Kwaja Wiesel. Um, what is your take on the free energy principle as proposed by Dr. Fritzton 
and embodied cognition. I'm not sure about the free, uh, uh, the free energy principle, but maybe uh, Stephanie wants to say something about uh, embodied cognition and yeah, I don't know. I also don't know what the free energy principle is. Um, but, but I never read these papers. What's that? You never read papers by Carl Friston. <laughs> but, um, but maybe you want to talk, you want to say something about embodied con cognition, Stephanie? And yeah, I think embodied cognition is super important. Um, so, you know, the if you look at the things people are good at, like plumbing, um, you know, what is going on that's hard is this interplay between action and sensing and planning and to me that's exactly the essence of of the unsolved problem um, in AI um, and it's the essence of what a robot is uh, so I think you know I think it's very important to be thinking about sensing acting and cognition together um, in order to solve you know in order to make progress uh, and I, I don't know like like you know to tie it back to Hilbert problems um, I I you know I would love to think about like what you know what are those milestones those goalposts along the way and, and I think that what is lacking now in, in the AI broadly defined you know the computer vision community and the computational linguistics community and the cognitive science community and the neuroscience community is this drive to put the pieces back together. George talks about reintegrating AI, right? Like putting these pieces back together in one system and thinking about the ways, um, like Gabriel was saying, the, 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 the structures and the computational elements and the algorithms that we need to put these pieces back together um, to make progress. And I think it really needs to be in an embodied setting because if you're embodied, you can't just do computer vision because you have to move too, you know, you have to plan too. Uh, so the embodied setting really forces you to think about those issues. That's why I work in it. So ju just to put another angle on this, and I have to say that I come from a different uh, uh, from a different angle on this question, but I'm I'm slowly uh, sort of shifting towards uh, Stephanie's view of the world. But uh, in general, um, I think that what we've been doing for many years now is uh, try to use a divide and conquer strategy, which is sort of the opposite of integration. So. Partly because I think it's easier if, we, if I want to study vision, uh, I, I don't want to have to worry about uh, motor cortex uh, in, in the brain. And I don't want to have to build a system that does all the amazing and very complicated aspects of navigation that, that Stefan was alluding to. I, I want to basically shut down everything else except for, for vision. And that, that has been a strategy, I think, that... Uh, to, to try to simplify and try to uh, isolate one, but but I, I'm slowly. I don't think it's wrong. It's a great strategy. We should keep doing it. You know, like there, that that needs to happen. But also, you know. Right. So, so, I, so I think it's a, it's it's a, I think it's a little bit of both. I think that there has been there's a lot of power in sort of isolating problems, uh, because I think if we want to uh, build a system that can do every possible intelligent task, that that sounds. Uh, 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 way overly ambitious to me right now. So, so I think it's good to have sort of a smaller tasks that we can, uh, uh, that, that we can grasp, uh, that, that we can grapple with and, and, and sort of uh, study. But at the same time, I think this, this idea of uh, uh, how do we integrate those systems, once we understand a little bit and make progress towards some of these pieces, how do we actually put them back together and how do we integrate them? I think that's very profound and, 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 and very important. So I think I, I would contend that we need both. Uh, Okay, uh, so we have a few more minutes. Maybe, uh, Chris, if you want to uh, take um, uh, some more questions uh, uh, from, from the audience. Um. Okay, we've got a great one here from uh, Quan Wan. Uh, to relay the topic of creativity, a lot of high-level abstract cognitive constructs like creativity or beauty might correspond to the heterogeneous computations in the neural circuits, i.e. what we think about or what we think we are doing uh, might not be what the brain thinks it's doing. How can we identify which human defined constructs are worthwhile or sensible to find the neural abstracts, uh, sorry, the neural subtracts for mechanisms uh, for uh, things such as math and language? Tommy, Stephanie. Um... So I, I think that I don't let me know just about say, neurons. 
So, so let, let me just say a few words here. So I, I think this is a very, uh, it's, it's an important question. And the general answer, I, I, I don't know. Um, this, this also brings the, the notion that uh, as scientists, we often use our intuitions to guide, uh, to guide us in terms of searching for uh, particular mechanisms. And, and we may very well be wrong, as you point out. We may, uh, we may think that a particular uh, uh, task or particular solution or particular path is, is, is the way the brain is solving problem, and, uh, but it may be um, completely off. Uh, uh, it may be completely off. So, so I think it's important to uh, uh, go through the three levels of analysis that Tommy was alluding to uh, in his earlier talk today. We want to be able to define the, the, the problems at the computational level. We want to be able to quantify at the behavioral level whether uh, the system, uh, humans or the robot or the, or the algorithm can solve it, and, the, and then go uh, 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 into the hardware and, and, and into the neuronal circuits and uh, to try to relate that uh, to mechanisms. Yeah, I think, um, you know, this is partly related to my Hilbert problem in which I was asking, you know, what are the, or could be circuits of neurons that can implement the um, typically human ability of language and reasoning, which I think have to be, have to have the flavor of programming and uh, routines have the, to have the flavor of, of logic. I, I think it's interesting if we want to draw a connection between the beginning of our discussion and now, and this question is to note that um, Hilbert's Hilbert's program, it's not directly related to his questions, but it's certainly related to what he did as a mathematician, was to axiomatize the all of mathematics. And, uh, and so his, uh, uh, actually his second problem, I think, was asking about whether mathematics is consistent, to prove that it's consistent and complete in the sense that he may not have used exactly those words, but completeness is the statement that the every property, every theorem um, can be proved, any property, any assertion, any statement can be proved as true or false within mathematics. And uh, uh, Gödel, 30 years later, disproved that. And this was the end of Hilbert's program. Mathematics cannot be self-consistent. There are statements that cannot be proved within actually arithmetic itself. So um, the interesting part is that what was born out of it um, is literally computer science because, because um, several of the people who started to work um, in issues strictly related to this program and its failure and uh, Gödel's results were Alan Turing working on the Entscheidung problem, um, deciding whether there is an algorithm that converges in a finite time and can state whether you can uh, prove or this or not prove that a statement can be pro can be proved or not and uh, this conclusion was you cannot do there is no program that fin finishes in a finite time that can tell you whether a statement can be um, proved to be unprovable or, or not and uh, um, and the other the other person is, uh, is uh, John von Neumann. Both of them ended up playing a key role in uh, defining, you know, computer science. And computer science itself was really born out of the necessity to mechanize logic and mathematics. So, um, 
So it's interesting, you know, how um, how Hilbert's problem or Hilbert is related to computer science and to this question of what are circuits in the brain that can um, can really run programs. In a sense, we did it for computers. We don't know how the brain does it. Okay, so we're running out of time, but I want to quickly uh, put uh, one more question out there from Meng Mizang in the audience, uh, just to tie this back to the to the beginning. Uh, maybe this is more for Tommy, but also Stephanie, if you have thoughts on this. So you, you mentioned that uh, about jobs, and you mentioned that um, uh, uh, physicians are out, plumbers are in. How about mathematicians themselves? Uh, do you think that we'll have uh, uh, general AI that will be able to solve all the Hilbert questions and all the problems in mathematics? Uh, when, when will we have uh, AI that can do uh, proof theorems in mathematics? <laughs> well, this is strictly related to what we were just discussing. Right. right. Can we have, you know, uh, circuits of neurons that can prove theorems. And uh, there, are, there are two ways to imagine that this will become possible. One is the optimistic way. And this is saying, yes, it will be, and we can have machines, neural networks of some type that will do what mathematicians do. The other one is say, forget about proving theorems will get computers powerful enough that will just run simulations and just, you know, forget about proofs. I mean, I mean one answer is we already do have, um, you know, programs that prove theorems. Um, one of the things that's happening in math yeah. right now is, is formally encoding the steps in a theorem in a, in a, in a program yeah. and then doing proof checking and, and stuff. Yes. Um, and it's trivial oh, yeah. to put some axioms in and start chunking out theorems. They're just not very interesting theorems. Yeah, it's not um, yet, uh, you know, creative or original enough, but you can see how it could become, right? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. But the opposite is the, the you know, the grim view that maybe mathematics is, will not be needed at all. It reminds me of something, Jerry, I, I, I asked Jerry Sussman once, like, you know, what happens when AI is solved? Like, will we not be, get to program anymore? I want to program. <laughs> and Jerry said, no, I'm always going to program because even if the AI comes and it can write all the programs for us, I want to write the program because that's how I think and that's how I understand it because I wrote the program. So I think that the, as long as there's people that want to understand it for themselves, there will always be programmers and theorem provers and mathematicians. Well, you know, on that line, um, computers are much better than humans on chess and go, but people still continue to play chess and go. Exactly. <laughs> yes. Okay, very good. So uh, thank you very much. I want to thank uh, uh, both uh, Tommy and Stephanie for being panelists in this uh, exciting uh, 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 discussion about Hilbert questions. And I want to thank everybody for participating. And we will continue tomorrow at uh, 12 uh, noon Eastern time uh, with uh, a very exciting talk by uh, Christoph Koch, whom uh, we've mentioned uh, before. And you will speak on? Uh, so I, I think uh, he may talk a little bit about consciousness, but mostly he's going to talk about uh, this from going from structure to function in the nervous system and some of the work that he's been leading at the Allen Institute uh, on, on, on relating uh, uh, two photon imaging and, and, and connectomics uh, and computational models uh, of the visual system. Thank so you. thank you. Thank you very much, everyone. And uh, I'll see you all tomorrow then. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Right, bye.